On behalf of the Board of Trustees of this wonderful museum, I'd like to welcome you today. I'm Kate Cox, Chairman of the Board, and we are so grateful to have our very good friend, Grady, to come and talk about this extraordinary artwork on this day of remembrance. I'd like to introduce to you now Douglas Highland, our Director of our Museum. Thank you. which 
when you look at these paintings, you have to, you have to consider the colors of the figures. You can think about, um, there was this, this great acting guy, which was in the uh, 18th century named Henry Sidney. And there's somebody else thinking about it. And I want you, when you look at me, and look at other paintings, to consider it. Henry Sidney said that the soul exercises equal power over every muscle. And what that means is that that deep thing, that wish you have when you have a little bit of joy, echoes through your body, and all of a sudden it comes out in your gestures, in your touch. And when I looked at this painting, I was thinking about how I like that idea, because I'm very interested in art history. I mean, you can look at my paintings by contrast to other contemporary works of art, and you can see that this guy really likes older paintings. It's a little bit of an anomaly. But when I was painting this, I wanted, first of all, to start telling the story of 9-11 in every gesture. So I talked about a figure. How would a figure who was in terror, how would that echo through every part of his body? His hands would be somehow show attention, perhaps. His would be uneasy coming towards you. How would a figure who was screaming? And how would these gestures echo through the body? And I think that that's a really interesting thing. Now, if you look at it, I, I've done that very consciously. And I will tell you, I spent, we were talking, I was with my friend Steve, who came to early times to have talk. But Steve, I think he's one of the places I'm going to have this conversation. And he asked the question, well, well how, did you, how did you manage to do this? Man? It was so big. And I said, sweat, 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 sweat. Thanks, 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 thanks. That's, 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 that's worry, 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 worry. Every day, every day. Okay, so I thought about this kind of thing on and on and on. So every little bit I have touched from the top of the cloud to the tiniest little uh, is a considered thing. And I think when you look at paintings, it's very interesting because art, when I say about allegory, is it's symbolic, but it also reminds us that art is, is a, a 30 second commercial. It's, I love that they, they actually uh, they proposed it. Moments are not so, you know, I was eating a lot of chicken nuggets. <laughs> <laughs> 
esoteric things, but it wasn't a little insignificant attribution. It was something a little bit larger. And of course, my echo of Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. It's an important part. And that could be a little bit held by great as can see when we did that. That's a painting that if you're a student growing up in East East Texas, I was in East Texas, there's not too many art books going on right there. You have Thomas Kincaid and Norman Rockwell. <laughs> Thing. Now, finally, number three, he talked about this relationship between two other big 
word is called the mimetic and the diegetic. The diegetic is a big word that nobody, my spell check always thinks I'm spelling this wrong. It's so esoteric. But it's really just a narrative. So we talked about being able to read an allegory verbally and, um, and metaphorically, or in a way, like a visual. So we've got a visual, we call it a man, children. What they carry visually, the mimetic, this looks like silver. This has a resonance. It has a provocative resonance, like, like a Baudelaire poem when we talk about the, the, you can almost smell the roses, that visceral, visual quality. And then you can read it as a narrative. You can say, well, this is like an old painting, reading from left to right, like a story. This is innocence here, the blind, the bold, he doesn't know what's going on. And these are two children. The blindfold is taking off this child because she's seeing the truth, the tragedy. This figure right here, they're both blind to the fate. One is terror. Because when you're terror, the terror, the first part is sort of a denial. And the other is tragedy, because tragedy carries a sort of acceptance. So we're reading this idea of both from youth, innocence, to awareness, to post on this side, where the sort of women are evocative of the three phase, and the aftermath. And wisdom or triage, then passing it on to another child. And this is a cycle. You notice that this little bit here is also here. So we keep reading it in a continual loop. So that's the narrative of uh, way of looking at thinking, allegorical narrative. So besides looking at this as individual objects, or we can read it in another way. So we're talking about all these multiple meanings of allegories. We can read it, this is great, and perish is life. Well, I need a mom. Now, I need a little kid. I'm not going to have my kid close for you. That's just awful. Well, then you said, the little thing calls on me is even more than And then the little kid comes in. This is part of the creation of the pain. Well, the kid wouldn't sit still. So we had to, like, bribe him with muffins and milk. So we're talking about these other things. And these, are, these were friends of mine. She lived in Northampton. And this one was, a, was actually the first, uh, it was the daughter of uh, the first couple who got married in Massachusetts for two women. First gay marriage there. This is a figure of Barry, who was a great friend who held this, held this post for me. This was a figure that I had to go in and, and, and come to Boston and pick up every time. These were women who graciously posed in this post for hours. And this was my professor at Harris College. And this was the daughter of my trainer, because I like to exercise. So this is another area of things. These are personal stories that get woven into this palimpsest. So we read it on so many different levels. We look at this figure, and I see old master painting. I see my history of what I grew up. I see the formal elements of what this means symbolically. And then I find personal elements that are woven into this. And I think we look at art as much as what the artist can tell us, but what we bring to the picture. I think that's a really reasonable thing. And it's why I find allegory so enticing. Now, Plato wrote an allegory, probably the one that everyone knows, the allegory of K and his Republic. And the, the story is a really interesting one. He talks about people who live in a cave that are turned toward a wall, actually tagging the wall. Well, all they see are the shadows cast from the people walking by in the fire just behind them. So their whole world, the whole world that they see, is a world of shadows. And then Plato asks you to imagine what happens when that person is brought into the light. They see real people. The person that was carrying the basket on their head was not a two-headed monster, but was a person with a basket. The person carrying the, the big Gucci bag was, was, was not someone with an extra appendage. Or, and, and they were, it may have just been off. I mean, the point is that there was, <laughs> there was truth in what was, what was being said. And really, Plato was, I, I love this, because he talks about, you know, I, I, I love Platonic ideas, the ideas of the essence of things, which is called the noumenon, and the specifics of things, which is called phenomenon, where this can represent the ideal rose as well as something specific for the protections. And we like to see people that way. But what Plato was talking about was enlightenment, and how education is enlightenment. But I started to think about what another thing was enlightening as well, and this is really important today. Imagine the change that you have when you've experienced tragedy, something very profoundly tragic. When your life has passed through that crucible of burning tragedy, don't you really go back and look at all the people like the people in the cave who live in a shadowy world not knowing with the veils 
with it all in a way. Don't you go back and say, well, you've not lost a person. How do you know? You've not lost your home. How do you know? It gives you this clarity of vision. And I think if we're at 9-11 and we're kind of worried about, uh, you know, we're, we thought, oh my God, why did this happen? We all come into this room as enlightened people in some way or another. We've lived through a tragedy together, but we've lived through many. But there'll be tragedies past, but that enlightenment, that burning the sun, almost like a pain in my view, has transformed us from people who live in a shadow of existence, people not knowing, people they were naive, to people who are And I like this idea how Alex, allegory like the Plato's can, can, can teach us these things. Allegories, hopefully, by that painting. So what is it really rescuing? What he does for me in painting, and looking back at his painting ten years later, here are things I would, I would, I could have painted this painting in many different ways. And people ask me why I do that, and I'll, uh, I'll say something a little bit about that. But they ask me why, you know, what it does when I look back is it jogs my memory. And I think that, that that's what it, 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 it rescues. It's like the parable of the wolf. It, 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 if you see something like that, and you, you see the lean times without the color, you remember that great time when you really lived, and you weren't afraid. Or you see that ant, or the smallness of life, and you remember, I felt that way before I made it. Um, when you see a figure of an old man reminds you of friends that you lost, a, a figure of a woman uh, bound together, you remember that time that you were in such grief that you didn't think you were going to get out of it. A time when you felt uneasy, where you felt that the world was falling apart. These are times, these are things that I think that allegory can rescue. And it not only rescues that, your personal experiences, it lets each and every one of you know that that happened to somebody else. And I think that's what art can bring to you. It gives us this sort of, like Schopen and Howard would say, a pause. So, what I want to do right now, and this is a little bit unorthodox, but I think that. Um, you know, I can go in and answer these questions on this room all that of pages. What I'd really like you to do is come to this painting as the sort of day progresses and look at it. And I'm really less interested in what I did in this picture because I would have done this a million times differently. But I'm interested in is what you think about. And I'm interested in hearing your stories from my brother. And I'm interested in hearing your comments on this. If you don't like it or like it, or you can not like it, you can't say it. <laughs> What I'm interested in is, is what watching and on the other I can see. And again, think about these layers. It's one thing, it's other. And, and finally, the final passage of the palace lesson is that we're here together. And if you're writing that on top of the story, that changes the meaning of the story. So I really thank you for all coming. And please stay here and raise your hand, and I will answer as long as people can stand to ask you questions. <laughs>
anybody ask us? Uh, this is a question that um, everyone asks about the handcuffs. And this is my own uh, symbol that I, this is something that I, that was my own invention. <laughs> you know, they're going to lock you in here. <laughs> Everyone asked me about the handcuffs. This is a, what happened was I, when I, I met people who had lost their husbands. A lot of them worked for Canada this year, old, which is not New York. And um, I remember these women getting together who were just completely helpless. And what it reminded me of was how difficult it is. One thing, and this is, this is what is a part of America. These are the two young girls here, and these are the women grown up. It's called the continuous, continuous narrative. It comes from early years. In the beginning, before, you, before tragedy, as you talk about your lives, you're gently leading somebody with a hand. And certainly after something that happens, you can't escape. I think that was probably when I talked to these people was the most horrible thing. So you know, for me, it's imagine what if I had done this, or what if I had done that, what if I had called them, or they had banged a sick day, or I had done something different, or they didn't get on the plane. Those are the ideas of it. When you're handcuffed and you're bound to faith, you, you, you just are completely, and I didn't think of any way else to, to one way was one way to symbolize that. Just that. Frustration. I just cannot get out. And also the sense of a sort of community on the secondary level about people who have to kind of get together and become a sort of community of, of, for a very strange reason. People may not even associate with it because I get trapped as well. Um, does anybody here? The airplane, is there any significance of a, one taking off and one crashing? Yeah. Are there any symbolism of all? This, this right here, these, the idea was, when I, when I, the idea behind the airplanes is that when I was a kid, my own ideas of the airplanes were all around vacation and fun. And to use them as weapons of mass destruction was just something I don't think anybody, I mean, we would be, you know, we would hear about people hijacking a plane going to Cuba, but you never thought of them as weapons. And so I wanted to strike this balance between what I thought of as toys, the memories that I had, going on trips to Walt Disney World, whatever, to the actual idea of, of, of being oversized and, and, and destructive. So this is obviously pointing to the of towers in a way that suggests that that's in part the reason why this is happening. Rather than a, a, a documentary, I did it for this reason. 
so that you can take your ideas of the flyer and this can grow as an image. And it doesn't have to be just about 9-11 in 100 years because unfortunately things will happen. I want people to take their lives and see in this to add their story, to add another page to this. If it's about fire, if you that, that visceral thing that you have inside can be reflected in this. Then you become it's a dialectic between what you can be offered and what I'm given. So it, it, it has a resonance. It's not so open-ended. It is about tragedy, but it can speak about tragedy to come or something. Any, anything that's on, from personal <coughs> to, to, to universal. St. John the Baptist, as well as preaching. Um, the ideas of uh, Perugino was an early Renaissance artist. There was Paint of Bible Down. These were things I was quoting so that people could see again that those other elements coming into the painting changed. There's no question that the, the framing is architectural in nature. Is that part of the structure you created? Uh, yes, but, uh, Troy Stafford is behind you. Troy, this is Troy Stafford. He, you know, he, he designed the frame as well as the dishes. I think this was his magnum opus on one level, too. He, he did a genius job. So. Constructs, curtains, and everything, and it sort of predated movies. So this idea of looking through some 
you know, your observation is a lot of place like this. Um, when did you know you wanted to become an artist? And what were your first My sentences? parents looked at me and they said, we don't want you to be a doctor. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> we want you to star. Yeah. 